Hello and welcome to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm here today to see something I've never seen before. The steam engine you see in front of you is not a restoration project. It is a brand new steam engine being built from scratch by the T1 Trust. This is Pennsylvania Railroad T1 number 5550. It's a mainline duplex drive locomotive with a 4444 wheel configuration and it will be the 53rd locomotive of its class. Sadly, all 52 that came before it have been scrapped. I'm going to give you a quick walk around tour, but I'll leave the rest of the explaining to somebody far more qualified than myself. Jason Johnson of the T1 Trust will be telling us everything we need to know about this beautiful streamliner and answering all of our questions. All right, Steve, go ahead. No. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so what you're seeing is a uh, uh, building of America's next mainline steam locomotive. Uh, the graphic here shows you what it's going to look like when it's done, so you can start seeing it taking shape here, get an idea of the size. Um, we we actually have a lot more parts than this, even already fabricated and created. So items like the wheels, the, so these 
big wheels that are on here are, are 80 inches diameter, so they're significantly above my head on that. Uh, those, we have four of them done. The other four are at the foundry right now being done. So those four will be completed sometime this summer. So we'll have all eight wheels for locomotive. Uh, and something to be think about as we go along, where this locomotive is now, in reality, it will be three feet taller than it is now. So this nose will be up three feet long higher than it is. It's actually, there's, as you can tell here, a significant uh, amount further in. So it's about 68 feet long. As it sits here, it's about 62 feet long uh, on that. So uh, we call this, this is the prow. This is the nose, this is the face. Love it, hate it. it, 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 it. Nobody's in the middle, you either love it or you hate it on it. Um, obviously, we uh, we kind of fancy it, so uh, why we chose the locomotive. Uh, this is all aluminum construction, and that is as built. So the Pennsylvania Railroad used aluminum construction on the nose, the cab is aluminum, and then all the streamlining that you see on that locomotive, and all that is aluminum. That saved 16,000 pounds on the weight of the locomotive by going to aluminum on that. So they were trying to keep their weight on their axles down on around 70,000 pounds, uh, uh, keep the bridge guys happy. So, <laughs> but I get down. so the actual boiler or the smoke box uh, is only really goes about here. So everything from here forward is really just what we call a window dressing. That's just for the streamlining, uh, for the look that they were going for at the time. You gotta remember the railroads in the 40s now, after World War II, they were competing with airplanes. So they had to create these space age streamlined locomotives to try to compete with the airlines to get passengers on there. Uh, so they had to do crazy things like this kind of streamlining to try to uh, appeal to those same people and keep them off airplanes and keep them on the, the rail. So uh, that's why you saw the big push more towards streamlining post World War II and in the early diesel locomotives and then being streamlined as well. So, um, and this locomotive was designed by a uh, fellow by the name of Raymond Lowy. He was a uh, gentleman who designed like the, the famous Coca-Cola bottle and logo and, and hundreds of other products that everybody's familiar with uh, when it comes down to it. So yeah, GG1, see, he was a famous, uh, there's really two famous uh, industrial designers of that time frame is Raymond Lowy and uh, uh, Dreyfus. So, uh, and, and they, they kind of compete in, in this world, but also in other industrial design world. So what, you end up seeing here is so the front of the smoke box and I'll get into is about right there. It starts right here. So there's water all the way back there to all the way to here. Uh, and then if you poke your head and after we this over, you can poke your head up inside there, take pictures, look inside. Uh, you'll see a big piece of steel in there with a bunch of holes all through it. That's just called the tube sheets. Uh, and that's where we'll get to that in a minute. What that is, but that's that's located right here. So this is a smoke box, and there'll be a set of cylinders underneath here that push the, that your exhaust to steam after it's been used to make the train go chugga chugga. Yeah, it goes up out and up to the smoke stack. So it uses a Venturi methodology to, to push the steam up and speeds it up through there, and it creates a vacuum in here. So this whole area becomes a huge vacuum chamber, negative pressure going through here, which then sucks all the fire air and stuff from the firebox on the other end all the way up through all this water and the piping through here to take all that heat out of that fire and put it into the water to boil the water and to make steam so all that, so in theory it was super efficient and you go through there you get all that uh, all your heat out of it you can put your hand right on top of that smokestack as it's coming out of there and you won't get your hand won't get burnt on that so it's you're you're trying to get as much of that heat out of there and into the water and into the steel which you possibly can. Um, so, so that's what it, there's a lot of other piping and stuff that goes in here I'm not gonna bore you with on with super heat and stuff and, and, uh, and there but, uh, but this has a dual because this has two sets of cylinders it has two smokestacks. The smokestacks are, are right next to each other so that all comes up through here on that so uh, we haven't cut it in yet uh, at some point in the near future we'll, we'll cast the smokestack and, and drop it in pretty simple process and uh, so we're not, not too uh, concerned about that at this stage of the game so it's more about getting uh, getting this uh, the pressure vessel of itself built first on that so uh, if everybody wants to kind of move down here a little ways I don't know everybody can hear me so 
So from that strap, I was explaining for so that front tube sheet is, that's where the front of the, where the water is. Back here, about 19 feet, there's tubes. There's another plate back here with all the holes in it, be that here, and there's a bunch of pipes, about 300 of them running through here. Then inside the middle of those pipes, that's what carries the exhaust gases from the fire in the back here, up through that and up out the stack. So that travels, and then there's water on the outside of any of those pipes going around there. So that's what's transferring that heat out uh, in there. So, uh, so that's there all the way to that point. Uh, then on top you have what's called the steam dome. That's your highest point. That's your driest steam. So that's where the steam is pulled off of there to go to when the engineer opens the throttle, opens a valve that allows steam to go to the cylinders on that, uh, and then makes you go forward, backwards, whatever direction you set it up on it. But we want to pull the driest steam off because we have the most power. So the driest, hottest steam will give us the most bang for the buck and expansion at the cylinders on that. But you get it too hot, you can't lubricate it. So you have this uh, um, this equilibrium you're trying to get to. So as hot as you can lubricate with, so you have the most power, but yet uh, not too hot that it burns up all your uh, rings and pistons that you have in it. So uh, it, it's a it's a fine get line you, you're playing with that. So, uh, so from everything here forward, it's been welded out. So if you see all the seams on there, they basically as a, a robotic welded. Uh, seams on there so they come through and they can only weld at like the 12 o'clock position because of uh, it's using uh, um, sand to dump sand in and it's welding underneath the sand and there's a little vacuum behind it that sucks the sand up as it goes so what they have to do is put this on a big rotisserie and rotate this whole thing at a certain rate to weld in all of these spots so and then after they're welded they come through and they x-ray them all uh, to make sure that the welds are perfect. There's no imperfections, no pitting, there's no inclusions, no no issues at all with those welds. Um, so they put that in there and, and keeps everybody uh, happy. And then we have to keep all that as it's basically it's conception records. You know, your birth record, your birth, these are conception. We're, we're basically, we have to go back and show where the steel was made at the steel mills. So we have all chemical analysis, mechanical analysis on every one of the pieces of steel and plate when it was made, where it was made, all that. And then same thing with the welds. And then all of those are uh, uh, x-rayed and verified that they're perfect so when it comes to that. Uh, so all that's been welded out and done. And we fit all this stuff together and we have, you'll see a lot of weld back here holding stuff together. Most of this weld will end up being ground out with a grinder or that's called an art gouge and, and cleaned out. And then we'll go back through with the same robotic welder and all of these seams from here back, we'll all get re-welded uh, when it's all said and done. Uh, they got to put the, there's a whole bunch of steel that still goes inside here that makes up the inner part of the firebox. Uh, that'll be made next. Uh, if we had put that in, we couldn't have brought this here. So, is, is the big push on it. So, it just happened that there, the shop that this is at got COVID real bad that it closed down for a couple weeks this spring. So, that delayed getting the inner stuff done. Well, because of that delay, we were able to bring it here. Had we had they had had that, then we probably wouldn't have been able to truck it over here. So it, it, it worked out for the best for everybody and, and allowed, a, allowed us to have this open house and, and let everybody come out the uh, last couple of days and see it. So uh, we're fortunate that. Um, and then you have, so we get a lot of questions like, what are all the holes for? And then there's a big cheese grater here. Um, what, so what happens is inside there, there's another sheet that parallels all of the firebox. So usually anywhere between six and eight inches gap between uh, on there. So, and they're flat, and because they're flat under pressure, they want to the pressure wants to push them apart. So you have a bolt, this one inch diameter, that goes between both of those sheets and it gets welded in there to stop that from bowing out. So they go they're every four inches on center on that. So they have 16 square inches behind it. But you get the math. Tell so I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I like the math and getting into all that. And tell you all the formulas of how to calculate the strength on this. We have to have a safety factor of four. So this boiler operates at 300 pounds of pressure. The reality of it is this boiler can handle 1,200 pounds of pressure before it would fail on that. So, um, and, and that's by design. So that's your safety factor. So if we're cruising down the railroad at 50 miles an hour, uh, it's a lot of momentum going down there. You got to make sure that it, it, there's a safety factors 
significantly built into this so that there's you know, no issues going later on. So, uh, so the, we're heavily regulated on that uh, between multiple different agencies and stuff, and we have to keep all those records and maintain that uh, to protect our own, protect ourselves really when it comes down to it, as well as the public. So you wouldn't want to be standing next to this if, if it was steamed up if we didn't take those. It, it wouldn't be safe to do so. Uh, we take those precautions so that when this thing's out and running, you can stand up right next to it, put your pictures on it, and put your kid right next to it, and not have any concern that's going to be an issue. With that so this is will be the most modern locomotive boiler built in 70 years uh, when it's all said, and should be the safest at that. So uh, today on the top there, um, we have all the extra pieces, parts like for this area here, um, but we left it off. I, they were going to put them on, I said, told them to leave it off. Which then you come in here, and now you have the ability to look inside the barrel, the boiler, and the firebox. It's a view you'll never get to see again. Next time you see this, it'll be a couple years, it'll be sitting on its frame. So you won't have the ability to, to, do, to look in there and see what, what it all looks like at that point. So here we take the opportunity to show that. Uh, then the, we have the cab back there. So all aluminum cab we manufactured several years ago. And uh, essentially, uh, as you see, there's not a lot of room in the cab. So back then, uh, in the 40s, it was two crews. They had an engineer and a fireman, two-man crew. That's it. Uh, so the cabs were built for two guys. Uh, so we built a, a locker. There's a locker in the back that's originally built in there. You would have hung your coat and your lunchbox and that kind of stuff in there on the crew. Um, we're going to turn that and we'll put some jump seats that kind of fold down off the back of the wall on there for... Uh, so we can have other riders and other people riding in the cab with the crew on that when it's in operation. Uh, one thing that we are going to is we are going to build it as an oil burner. It originally was a coal burner. So um, it's not one of So tip right now, currently, uh, coal is still probably uh, half, costs about half as much money for a per BTU unit of energy to generate um, as oil. So oil is twice as expensive currently. But when you calculate the factor of handling that coal to get it delivered, uh, get it from a truck into the top of a tender, uh, dispose of all the ash in it, um, right now they're probably both on par uh, of the actual cost per BTU when you factor in all the cost and the inconvenience. So this locomotive will be all roller bearing and with the oil on it. When you, as from an operating crew, you get in at the end of the night, you get in, you turn the oil off, you walk away from the engine, and you're done and, uh, to it. So you don't have to go greasing rods and do all this fancy stuff that a lot of the other groups you have to do. You don't, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So uh, as far as modern, you just get off, and that's appealing to other railroads to run on, that you can go, uh, a truck can pull up next to it, uh, hook up their uh, oil pump to it, start filling it full of oil. The truck driver gets on, plays on Facebook for a little bit, and then 10 minutes later it's filled up, and and uh, you're done. So that's the extent of uh, that, that ease is there's, there is a tremendous value in that when you're operating out there on the main line. So uh, we're going to take advantage of that and, and use that uh, to our benefit. So uh, a lot of purists would like us to be coal burning. We would like us to be coal burning, but we have to be realists at the same token. We sat back and watched the Union Pacific with the, with, when they converted the uh, big boy from uh, coal to oil, see what kind of pushback a lot of people would give on that. There was next to nothing pushback. There are still tens of thousands of people trackside every time the big boy runs. Go out and see it. Didn't keep anybody home. So people might complain about it, but they they still were out there trackside with their cameras. So you know uh, we weren't overly too concerned about it. So uh, on that. Uh, so here this afternoon, about 1:30, 2 o'clock, we'll start tearing this all down, and then all this whole boiler is going to go back to St. Louis. Uh, so they can finish working on this. Next step is uh, we're working on the finishing up the engineering on the frame. We hope to get a bid on the frame come October and award the contract uh, November 1st. So there's potential that we might even cut steel for the frame of this thing by the end of this year. So th that's uh, uh, pretty exciting for us and the next step moving forward. So um, we hope to get that going and then you know all so in a lot of our minds the engineering everything's done on this now we focus on the frame once the frame is done under well underway then we'll finish up the engineering on the engine truck and the trailing truck so we can build that and if that's in we're already finished up the wheels like I said we'll have the wheels by the end of summer and we'll get right into uh, doing the uh, 
um, driver tires, uh, the axles, the roller bearings, all that stuff. We have all that stuff already done, so we'll, we'll get right into that concurrently while working on the frame and finishing the boiler. When the boiler is done, by our standards, it won't have any of those tubes in it that we talked about. So we'll leave those out. That's when the regulation for us begins with the boiler time with the Federal Railroad Administration. So we'll keep those out, we'll get the boiler mount on the frame, get all, all the piping done on the outside, get a lot of the, the stuff tested and completed. Then we'll install the tubes, and once we install those tubes on the inside, the clocks are ticking for us. So we'll, that, that begins our regulation uh, clock, per se. So we'll hold that off, do as much as we can elsewhere, and then we'll go into that uh, as the next step. So that, that's the kind of the plan for that, uh, move forward and what we're into. So, uh, questions? Oh, good. How far east will it be able to cut? All right, I was just going to answer that question because I've had it a hundred times this weekend. So, where will it run, and how? Kind of sum up that question. So, what we're going to do with it when it's done? Um, I'll kind of answer your question with that uh, bigger question here. Uh, it will go to uh, short line regional railroads throughout, mostly throughout the east. Um, we can pretty much cover. Uh, we obviously we can't go on the northeast border because of restrictions, but we can get up. If we want to go to Maine, we can go to Maine if the opportunity uh, want present itself. Uh, we go to Florida, there's really no restrictions. We can go pretty much anywhere an SD70 locomotive could go uh, on a modern system. So uh, there's very few restrictions. Uh, so you have some of your branch lines and stuff like that that won't be able to take the weight, won't be able to take, uh, uh, typically weight's gonna be your biggest problem. So bridges will be on there. So the, the smaller locomotives on the branch lines. But uh, but anywhere like 611, 765 can go, we'll be able to go. So mm -hmm. yes, we could spend a summer at Strasburg just like 611 is. I often get the question like, oh, you know why? The economics right now do not permit doing mainline excursions. You can do them, despite what other people say, you can do them, but by the time you lease the passenger cars, pay for the insurance requirements the class ones require, uh, and pay for all the other expenses associated with operating steam, there's no money left over, you'd be looking at $2,000 a seat to sit on it. Mm. Or you go to Strasbourg, run back and forth, people are paying $20 a seat to ride on it, and now every person of every age has the ability to do it. So it makes better business sense for us to go the 611 and the 765 route that they're doing than to try to go do a, some big mainline program. Now, if a class one railroad came to us wanting to do a heritage program underneath of them, then we would do that because then we're using their tracks, their insurance, their cars. The economics change for that. But the economics for us to do it, any mainline steam operator doesn't exist currently. I'm not saying that five years, so railroad management changes every three years. So we're still two management changes away from operating when it, when it comes down to it. So for us to go discuss with the, the big railroads on, and talk to that, be a complete waste of our time right now. We're better off focusing on finishing locomotive. We've had a, a whole bunch of uh, operators come to us and say, hey, why don't you come run on our railroad? It'll support it. Uh, these railroads are already running other uh, engines. So we really feel pretty comfortable with that and have no real concern about where to run and finding a place to run it. And when we go there, we'll go there for six months at a time. We're not going to go and do a weekend trip and then go somewhere else. We'll stay and do you know, we'll do it throughout time. We'll allow people to come and run this engine back and forth on a section of track. Uh, we'll let them, you know, do just run, do cab rides, uh, you know, uh, do photo charters, um, uh, all kinds of different stuff on it. So we're, uh, we're not opposed to any of that stuff. So we'll, we'll keep it open in mind. So, is this going to be articulated like the big boy? No. So there, this is it's not articulated. So it has one solid frame, but it has what's called, it, this has got poor man's articulation. So for those that don't know what articulation is, it's where the frame is hinged in the middle. So the, the frames are so long, they can bend to get around curves. They can pivot. Um, this doesn't have that, but this has something else. It has enough lateral in the, the wheels that allow it to flex two inches on there. So it's a, what we call a poor man's articulation. Because in a regular locomotive, you have a long uh, series of rods connecting it. So it makes it very rigid, so you can't really adjust it. This has only one side rod for two wheels. So now you have a lot of ability to pivot those two wheels together without flexing all the other stuff down the line. So 
that with that motion on there will get you around a 16 to 18 degree curve putting anywhere uh, except I said uh, anywhere like an SD40 or SD60 diesel locomotive can go currently so um, if, if they can go there we can go there we'll have the same axle loading and we'll have the same uh, curvature rating signs so. What's that? How long is the tender going to be? Like, uh, the tender's sitting safe up in Buffalo. We don't have any plans on it. it we're, we're, honestly, probably two years before we go up and touch it. What's the distance on it? The length of the tender is 65 feet long. So it doubles the length of this. So you're looking at 68 feet here, you're looking at 65 there. So, uh, so it, it, it's, it, 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 the whole locomotive will be double. So about where that gentleman's walking will be the end of this locomotive when it's done. So, this locomotive is 126 feet long. The Union Pacific Big Boy is 133 feet long. So, in all said difference, we're six, seven feet difference in overall length. Uh, well, if we're sitting next to each other, we're actually longer than a uh, Union Pacific Challenger. So, uh, on it, to give you an idea of overall length of it. So, uh, we're, we we'll weigh in fully loaded at like 990 thousand pounds. So, just under a million pounds uh, when it's all said and done. So, 500 tons. Uh, on that, so so it, it's the the Europeans hate it when we say uh, pounds. They like they like their tons on that. So. <laughs> uh, we always get corrected online. We say it's a million pounds. And they're like, no, it's 500, 500 tons. Like, oh, okay, yeah, well, so, same thing. Yeah, so, so but, yeah. I am a little confused because of what I don't know. I understand firebox. I don't understand combustion chamber. All right, good question. So. Uh, I'll give you kind of thermodynamics 101 here. So we're like where those red lines are, there's going to be a burner down there. So basically it's going to have a pipe coming in, it's going to drop raw fuel onto a plate, and on a plate, it's like my fingers, there's grooves on it, and there's steam jets that shoot out. That oil drops down on there, and that blows it out, and, it, and it's on fire at that point. So now you have this big ball of fire, and then underneath here there's a bunch of tubes that let air in underneath it, and they're uh, arranged in a kind of a weird way in there. That way is designed to make it like a tornado in here. So the air is coming in, it's turbulent, it's a big, a big tornado. So the air, the fire comes in and it shoots right back at the cab, right at the fireman and the engineer really. Shoots right back at that, it hits brick. So the, the lower part is all aligned with a refractory brick. So the fire comes back, hits that brick on that, and then comes around, and then now you have this exhaust coming out there, and sucking all the air forward back hits the brick and then comes up curls back around goes back out the combustion chamber is one last place for it to go and then we're going to have over fire jets over fire tubes on here that's letting more oxygen in above the fire so that oxygen and that what raw gas is left in there unburnt will mix here in the combustion chamber and before there. going and then it goes into all those tubes okay. and up through the water and there's still water all around this but all right, it'll go through that and then up out the stack. So, so this is a secondary burn of gas. So it's what's called post-secondary combustion okay. air uh, mixing chamber. We call it a combustion chamber for short. But, okay. But uh, on there, so how it comes up. So you think of it like a question mark, how it goes up and around. Okay. All that Got gas it. goes back and then it's sucked forward. So it's it, it shoved back and then sucked forward. That fills that whole fire, that whole box full of fire. So that basically, like we're trying to suck out all that heat out of that fire by the time it gets out that stack. So, like I said, in theory, I should be able to hold my hand over top of that smokestack and not get burnt on that. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Very helpful. Other questions? So, uh, when you put together the clock start, so explain what that means. So, and what you're all right. So basically, the Federal Railroad Administration requires us every 15 years to do a boiler inspection. Which means removing all these tubes inside. Uh, so we have, as a calendar year, we have, you have so many days, 1,472 days of operation, which is like five years. We ran every day for five years. We have to tear down for five years, or 15 years, whichever comes first on there. So, uh, so our worst case scenario, at, at 15 years. So, I have 15 years before I got to tear it all back apart again. Okay. So, the longer I hold off on that clock starting, the better. And then, so basically, if I get everything else done. So then we focus on all the running gear and, and all that to make it go, and uh, then we can do and get the boiler, uh, put those tubes in, and then we start the clock, and then at that point you fire it up and you can go, and, and then go. So we want to hold off on that. That is like kind of our uh, birth date, per se. So uh, so like when we have our uh, there'll be a builder's plate up here, 
to say when the locomotive was built. Whatever year that is, that'll be the birth date of the locomotive. So, so we're still in the conception phase. <laughs> so, on it. It's a very long pregnancy. Yeah, it's a very long pregnancy. <laughs> is that the uh, original T1 whistle available to use? Yeah, I I purchased one back in 1997, not knowing that it'd be. So, uh, I've donated that to the trust. So. Uh, like those familiar, I, I spent 11 years at the Ohio Central Railroad. That I had that Pepsi T1 whistle on all of our engines on most of the mainline excursions. So. We ran on the Pennsylvania Railroad Panhandle Division. The T1s ran over uh, uh, large, on the, all the way to Saint, from Pittsburgh, St. Louis. They ran over that division through Columbus uh, at, high, at super high speeds. Very, very appropriate. The, the gentleman that got me involved in all this stuff was uh, an engineer who worked for Pepsi, ran T1s. I, I grew up through listening to the stories in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade of uh, operating Pensy T1s. He used to talk about when he, ever he'd get on the cab of a T1, he always carried a rag in his back pocket. He, then when he got on the cab, sit down in the engineer seat, he'd pull that rag out of his pocket and cover the speedometer. And uh, he said because there's a, there's a gut factor in there when you're running at 120 miles an hour, he said they were cruising along on that, that same section of track, he said uh, the rag vibrated off there and it was reading 115 on the speedometer and he said all of a sudden you just get this knot in your gut like you're that you're cruising he, didn't, he said it didn't feel like you're going that fast and moving along there and he said all of a sudden it became real so they said so they would cover the the speedometer so they wouldn't uh, do it so you know it's one of those things you know I was probably sixth grade or so uh in 13 years old and I'm hearing a story about that and it, it's always stuck with me and, and and, and he was telling it like it was like he was getting on the cab that, that day. So, you know, he, he all these memories. He he would disappear at a different time when he talked about the T1s at that stage. So. Our guys never do that. What's that? Our guys never do that. Oh, yeah, no. Much about the speedometer being too slow by five miles an yeah, hour. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, there is that now. So, and how accurate it was back then, but yeah, I mean, 115 is 115. I don't care how you. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's still a lot. It's still a lot of mass moving along. No matter what, what we cut, it's still going pretty damn fast. Yeah. So well, speaking of the, the speedometer, what about the speed record? Um, so yeah, the speed record, and we've been very clear on it. Um, we have uh, a sponsor stepped up and will pay for us to go to Pueblo, Colorado, uh, and uh, to do testing out there. They have a 30 mile uh, FRA test loop, no crossings. Uh, that's where they test all the high-speed trains out there. We've already talked to them. Uh, we know what the, the requirements are and, and how to meet those requirements and satisfy them to do so. So, um, uh, so that at that situation, you know, um, the downside of that is that no one will be allowed to be there other than the test people when it happens. So, uh, uh, good, bad, or different, but it will be very well documented. So all I can say is the, the people that are stepping up to do it are a very well-known film company. So. What's the uh, record? So, the bridge won't be too happy about it. 126.7 yeah, <laughs> miles an hour so, is, the, is the speed record. That's the official speed record done by uh, in, in the UK. By Mallard. When was that set? Uh, 38. 38. So. Do you think you'll be able to beat it? So <laughs> the anecdotal is yes, because if you look at the T1s, these things are built for speed. We have thousands of pages of documents on these. So from like Crestline, Ohio to Fort Wayne, Indiana, the area called the racetrack, it's like 31, 32 miles straight, not a curve in a thing. So uh, I think Trains published an article several years ago, a gentleman that was running the, uh, his last run on a tee uh, on there. He said, let's tow his fireman and let's see what this thing will really do. So over that 31 miles, the average speed was 131 miles an hour. So they said they got into Fort Wayne, got off, the road foreman came over, slapped him on the wrist, and then gave him a wink on the deal. So, you know, it was on the deal. So, and like I said, it's a, it's a very well written article. Uh, it, it's available online to go and read. It's very interesting. It guy kind of goes in extreme detail about the, uh, the operation uh, that they did. They just kind of went and just kept going. The speedometers only went to 120. On the things, so the speedometer is pegged on the dial. They and uh, they really are. They went by that. They don't really know how fast they went. They just knew that their average speed over that 30 miles was 131 miles based on the time they left 
And the time they yeah. went. So when they did the math on it, that took acceleration and deceleration. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and they had a slow order in there somewhere. So, and they yeah. had a slow order in the middle somewhere. So yeah, uh -huh, on there. So that it, it, that's we do the math on it. So uh, Franklin, the people that provide the running gear on the locomotive, uh, they were so these things were breaking springs like crazy on the pop-up valves. Well, they were designed for 100 miles an hour, but they kept breaking springs. They couldn't figure out why. Franklin engineers came out and were riding along with them. And they're clocking the mileposts and like, yeah, something's just not right here on the, on the, so they're clocking 125, 130, and then uh, even one of them was 141, uh, with their clock and when they did the math back on it. And like, well, there's your problem. So they went and they went, uh, had to improve, uh, had to put a heavy duty spring in all the T1s on all of it to counteract that because they were running them at 120 mile an hour plus on a regular basis. They didn't. They didn't care about the speed record. It was they cared about beating New York Central and Chicago. That was it. They, everything was based on how. So can I get to Chicago faster than from New York City? Can I get there faster than, than the New York Central and TWA? So those. That's who they looked at. So they were. They were competing against the airlines and competing against New York Central to get people from Chicago between Chicago and New York City. So that was. That was. They don't care about the world record. Who can do it fastest? So. So that, that's that was that was that era. These were built in '45, were scrapped in '56. So 11 years. It's going to take us longer to build it than it will to uh, that they were in existence. So. How many miles do you think it'll take us to get up to that speed? I think it, it, it'll be pretty quick. So the so the, the NW uh, leased several of these engines as other alternatives to the J's whether they're going to build another set of J's or purchase some T1's. Um, and we have all the documentations. Uh, everything the NW said was the T1 compared to the NWJ, which is arguably the finest 484 ever built mathematically. I mean, just everything about it, it's, it's perfect in proportions operation on, on what the NWJ built. The T1 was every bit as good of it, apples to apples to 80 miles an hour. At 80 miles an hour, there was no comparison. The T1 was there. Was, it, it had no no other uh, competitor in that range. At 100 miles an hour, this this still has 6,000 horsepower available at 100 miles an hour. And that's coming from the Junior test track uh, 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 test plant. They can actually test them at those speeds. Yeah, so, uh, which is pretty unique to have still have 6,000 horsepower available to you at 100 miles an hour to help you continue to accelerate through. So, so. Thank you, sir. So, any other questions? Yeah. How was the original as well? Or was it uh, it's riveted. So, a uh, seam like this, you would have one out, one under, and they were lapped over, and then you would have had rivets uh, holding them together. That's how the original would have been done. Um, if they had continued, now they were already starting to build welded boilers in the late 40s, in the 50s. They would have, this has been the technology that they would have done, gone to. They would have got away from. Uh, Welding really wasn't quite there in the 30s and 40s. Uh, World War II really helped welding. Uh, building tanks stuff really take off. So you know, early on World War II, you, you saw a lot of riveted uh, construction. By the end of World War II, it was all welded construction. And I'm, and I'm talking about military equipment and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, so, okay, yes, we, we talked to Timkin on a regular basis. So, uh, the, my shop in Ohio, is um, a mile and a, or about half a mile from the Timken facility where the bearings will be built. I work Philly Gear. Okay, yeah, yeah. So they're in their corporate headquarters is up in Canton, uh, um, and so we're working with a guy that, that knows everything about the bearings for this, and a pretty, pretty amazing fellow on that. Uh, so he, he he knows the drawing numbers by heart. It's the craziest thing. <laughs> <laughs> so on that. So, but yes, uh, Timkins are. Uh, a, a, so they will build the, the, all the roller bearings for us, the side rods and the mains on that. And then we're hoping to do all tip and everything else as well. So. Can you speak a little bit about the tender? I know that it was a donation. It was an m one tender originally. The question was, what about the tender that we bought? So um, back in the uh, early 60s, there was an m one b tender, you are correct. Uh, Pensy tender, it's the freight configuration of our tender was put in the maintenance way service and, and provided oil, it, it carried fuel oil for the maintenance away vehicles. So it has couplers at both ends 
and, and so held 30,000 gallons of uh, fuel oil in it um, so they could fuel their vehicles. Uh, that tender did that until the early 80s, then went to Hagerstown. A lot of people see it there, Hagerstown was painted yellow, uh, sat in Hagerstown for years. Then went, it got, found its way to Wilmington and Western one way or another, it was at the Wilmington Western for several years, and then was donated to the Western New York Rare Historical Site. They have the Pensy I-1, the 210 up there, and there, at that time it was original talk that they're going to swap tenders up there, that that, that engine would get the, our, uh, the tender that they have. Well, um, we went up there and threw uh, persistence, so in eight different meetings and just beat them down until they finally sold me the tender. Uh, <laughs> make me go. So, so they sold us the tender for $25,000. Wow. Uh, would have cost us roughly three million dollars to build that tender at that yeah. time. So probably even more now. So uh, and we only have about two hundred fifty thousand. We're actually rebuilding it. And that's with all new wheels and roller bearings and everything else underneath it. We'll do a full Amtrak inspection and uh, certification underneath the tender uh, when it comes out. So it'll be technically qualified. Same qualifications for high speed running on the Amtrak. The tender will get. Gotcha. So I'm on that. So we'll, we'll follow through that. So. Um, so listen, and they charge me a dollar a year to store it. So it's so we're just gonna let it sit up there for the next two years while we get the frame done and getting that, uh, and then we'll turn our focus on to the, the tender. Very cool. No, that stay bolts go in there. So, so the, we've done for us. So basically, there's an inner uh, piece that's parallel to that. It's about six or eight inches gap between them. And then a bolt goes through there and gets welded that holds it all together, inside and outside together. So, because you have 300 pounds of pressure per square inch in there pushing out away, so you have to use that to hold it all together. So, so you have 3,500 of those bolts on this whole locomotive holding it together. So, so when you're finished and everything's running, where's home? Uh, we don't know yet. So, here's the. Uh, I tell people we're, we are now entering our junior year of college. We have not decided what we're going to be when we grow up or where we're going to go. So, uh, so uh, where's the work? we may take a two-year master's program. I don't know, but that, that's kind of where we are right now. And, and uh, on that, so uh, we've had a lot of offers of places to store us um, that are that are either going to be built or already built. To take it. Um, the benefit is right now we can kind of hold off and see what the best option is. Because we don't know what the railroad environment is going to be like in six years, five, six years. So until that point comes along, um, we're in no hurry to have to make that decision today. So if we make that decision today, the high likelihood it wouldn't be the best decision when the engine's completed. So, Sugar Creek big enough? Yeah, th and they've reached out to me. I mean, that's I'm 15 minutes from there, so that, that would obviously be, uh, uh, I like that, but that might not be the best option because I'm restricted on where I can run there. So. Because um, it's owned by the Genesee, the rare is owned by the Genesee, Wyoming, which would not permit running on steam. But obviously, the facility there would, would handle it. So they have offered, they have given offered the extension for us to bring the locomotive there and put it together. So they're they're one of the places that have done that. So uh, they've they've come out and they've done a lot of work and helped us. I, I take stuff up there to the, to the roundhouse all the time, back shop and make parts up there for this thing, take them back. So use their equipment. And then he ever charges for it. So they're they're supportive. The nice thing about the steam community, and, and then it's very small, but everybody helps very each other fun. out. So uh, it, it it's it's been great. So if we call somebody up at Strasburg or somewhere else and and need something, they they will bend over backwards and help us do it. So we've been very fortunate there. So. Any other questions? Are you planning on running with an auxiliary water tender? So yeah, we're talking about um. Yes, we will have some sort of auxiliary water tender. Um, personally, I, I've had a little bit of a dream for the last 30 years, is I want to build an RPO with auxiliary water and put four big ballasted tanks in it, carry an extra 20,000 gallons of water in, in an RPO So as my auxiliary tender. So, uh, and there's several of them out there that can support the weight and do it. So we, we may do something like that. At the very least, uh, we'll just do a, you know, the same type of auxiliary tender 611 or 765 has carried extra 25,000 gallons. Yeah, so railway post office like a baggage car. 
uh, uh, type of car. So it would have been prototypical what would have been behind the T1 uh, when it was running. So they would have the mail cars in the front of the train and then passenger cars behind that. So we put a, a railway post office car behind the, the locomotive and then put big water tanks in it as additional water for it. Because you can just have a fire hose hook up underneath it to fill it and, and, and take it out. So it's not that, not that big a deal. So it's handling, just engineering the car to handle the weight of the water is your biggest thing. So, but, but if we can do this, we can do that. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not too overly concerned about that. Uh, so we, we got enough engineering uh, brain power to pull that off So and keep everybody happy. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank welcome. you very much. Hey, and I want to say thank you to everybody who came out here and helped support us. Like I said, you know, we want to show everybody what their dollars and donations have made over the last seven, eight years, what it's doing. So, you know, it, we being transparent is very important to us that you see what we're spending the money on, that we're not off, uh, you know, uh, doing nefarious things with it. So we're, we're actually taking the dollars and putting it to steal. So, um, and as we do along with the frame, you keep uh, follow us on Facebook. Um, we have forms over there you can fill out. Uh, we have a membership. Membership is 100% free. So the, you can sign up for that and we'll mail you stuff, email you updates on that if you don't get those already. Um, that's a great way to find out what's going on when we're going to have events like this. Uh, um, that's the best way to do it. So if nothing else before you leave here, um, go uh, fill out a membership form. Again, there's no, uh, it's free. All we do is give us the ability to uh, um, keep in touch with everybody that's here and let you know what we're doing. So um, come out and see us again. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.